Before we start, Scarlet wants to say hi. She doesn't want to jump up, which is good because we've been teaching her not to jump, so I'm probably really confusing her right now. Oh, here we go. Yes, I know. Say hi, Scarlet. Say hi. Yes. So Scarlet's kind of tired. She's been playing fetch today. We're trying to work on the, the face biting thing. All right. Hopefully she'll settle back down and uh, take a nap or something while we do this. So we are back with Napoleon's Marshals Part 2. I don't know why I'm saying it like that. So as a lot of you probably know, I've been sick, which is why it's been so long since I posted on my channel. And we're finally getting back to this. You can hear my voice is still a little like, you know, raspy. But you know what? I feel fine. So we're just going to go ahead and do this. At least I can talk. All right. I think I'm going to have to go put the dog outside. Okay. She was just standing at the door like she wanted to leave, so I didn't want to, you know, force her to stay in here. <clears throat> She's been getting me up between like 5 and 6 o'clock in the morning, which I'm not used to. I'm not a morning person, so I've been a little tired lately. Anyway, back to Napoleon's marshals. So in part one, we covered the first eight marshals, or kind of like the last eight marshals, because they're ranking them on Epic History TV. And we're going to end with the number one marshal, or who they think is the number one marshal. But will it be my number one marshal? I don't know. As I said before, I think DeVoe is probably going to end up being my favorite marshal at the end of the day based on the Epic History TV series that we watched on the Napoleonic Wars, but that may not be the case by the time I finish this series. So the eight marshals that we covered last time were, yeah, these names are not going to be right. Yes, I know I can Google them, but I'm not going to sit here and, you know, do that on camera as I do this. You guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, we have Perignon, Brune, um, Sibier, Kellerman. Grushi, Monsi, Poniatowski, and Shodan, or something like that. I have to say that out of those eight, for some reason Kellerman stuck out to me, so I have to say of this eight, Kellerman might be my favorite marshal. Not sure why. I think it was cool that his son became a general and kind of like followed in his footsteps and I guess was a pretty good cavalry general for Napoleon. I kind of like where his career went after he retired as a marshal and he kind of looks like George Washington to me too so maybe that has something to do with it. So we'll see out of these next eight what my favorite one is. So I'm gonna kind of like take my favorite one from each one of these videos and then stack them up against each other at the end of this. So Kellerman, you've got my vote so far from these eight. I know he didn't have a spectacular career or anything like that but I'm going off of weird things, I guess, um, on, on how I judge them. So before we get into these next eight, I'm assuming it's going to be eight, we're going to get into comment time where I go back and I review some of your comments that answered my questions from the last video. And if you don't want to watch this part and you just want to go right to the reaction, click on the reaction chapter in this video and go straight there. But let's do comment time. <laughs> So in the last video, they talked about the restored monarchy and how King Louis came back to the throne again. I don't really know the history behind that, so I kind of was asking about that. Amanda Petrovic says the restored King Louis XVIII was the brother of King Louis XVI who was executed during the revolution, who I do know about him because I did watch the uh, French Revolution videos by Oversimplified. He goes on to say, also just wait till you hear about Marshal Winnedot, I'm assuming. He was totally amazing. Okay, well, let's see if he ends up being one of my favorite ones. I was also wondering about like the Bourbon Kings and King Charles because I associate King Charles with England for some reason, but I was surprised with some of your comments. You guys told me that King Charles is actually like a French name. Uh, Skidifer says the King Charles of the video is King Charles X, King of France from 1824 to 1830. His reign occurred after one of his big brothers, Louis XVIII, who we just referenced, took power in 1815 after Napoleon's downfall. Chris had 10 kings named Charles. How, well, how do I not know Charles is a French name? The first being the most famous Charlemagne. See, Charlemagne sounds French. Is Charles just like short for Charlemagne? Because if it is, 
I feel really stupid for not knowing that. I mean, it pretty much looks like the same name, you know, with just the main chopped off. The, uh, in, you know, I'm gonna say the invalids is probably like Invalides or something. Um, the military hospital was not built by Napoleon, but by Louis the 14th. Okay, so it kind of goes back a little ways. One of my favorite parts of the last video was seeing the balloon and them using it for like reconnaissance on the battlefield back, way back in the early 1800s. That was just really cool to me. Nerfs says about the balloons they were a common thing into world war one and shooting them down wasn't as easy or as dangerous as it sounds even the hydrogen filled zeppelin balloons needed incendiary incendiary rounds to really wreck them yeah it looks you know it looks like you can just like shoot a bullet and pop them down but i guess they're a lot harder to shoot down than that that would uh, be a really really fun video if you guys know any videos that go into like b like balloon warfare you know back in the day let me know because i would be really interested in watching that uh sir myth uh says a 354 this is beethoven's egmont overture um he wants me to check it out and this would go along really well with our music sundays that we do on here um we learned about beethoven in howard goodall's story of music they did mention i think the egmont overture and i had a lot of uh comments about that saying that i should look into it because it ties in with napoleon so we're gonna have to do that actually that would be a really good one to do um i think we're gonna be doing sabaton this next sunday because i've had so many re requests for that but i think this would be a good follow-up to that. There was a quote in this last video where Napoleon said he used one of- or he used Marshal Jordan ill and I didn't understand what that meant. Deeks25 says, with regards to the quote about Jordan, use him ill as a way of saying Napoleon treated Jordan badly or didn't give him credit that he deserved. So uh, I didn't, I had never heard of that term ill being used in that way before. There was a picture in this last video also of one of the marshals who was just like casually standing underneath the firing squad you know with like his hands on his hip as if he was just like observing you know a crowd at the mall or something and uh he was about to like die and be shot by a firing squad and i was like what the heck is going on and uh peter smith says an a was executed and his last request was to give the firing squad orders himself that's actually that's pretty that's like pretty badass you know also like really really more <laughs> at the same time. It makes me think that Ney was one of those like devil may care personalities which might be why he was uh I don't know like I heard him a lot in the, in the uh, Napoleonic Wars videos so I'm assuming that he was probably like considered one of the top marshals. I expect to see him in this last video in this series up there with like the top, I don't know, like maybe five marshals or something. They did mention dragoons in this last video and I didn't quite uh, recall what they were. Hyperspace, I'm assuming that's a play on space. Uh, dragoons were a type of cavalry armed with firearms so that they could ride to a position, dismount and fight as infantry. They were also used as conventional cavalry. So, okay. So they were kind of of light transformers you know they could ride in as cavalry dismant fight as infantry sounds like an interesting outfit to be part of actually seaweed says the seven years war the french indian war for many americans is indeed a very interesting and important subject since it sometimes was called the first global war or the first world war i have heard that before about it but what i do know about the seven years war is that it was um i think instigated by an incident that happened over here it wasn't the united states yet but would become the united states States involving France and I think Native Americans, maybe George Washington, <laughs> but I don't know uh, anything about it. Again, it's, it's something I know I studied in school, but um, you know, I just, I don't remember stuff that I learned when I was 10 or however old I was, you know, not much, not that much older than 10. All right, anyway, that's it for comment time. We're gonna jump into this video for part two of Napoleon's Marshals. Now you guys know I'm probably gonna have a ton of questions. I will pause it um, if I have a question I need to ask you guys. Feel free to answer my questions down in the comments. I'm interested to see what the next eight uh, worst marshals are as we count down to the best ones. And it's always interesting for me to see if I recognize any of their names from the Napoleonic Wars videos that we watched. So let's get started. <laughs> Terror Belly, Decus Pacis. Terror in War, ornament in peace. The words inscribed on every French marshal's baton. 
In France, the title of Marshal or Maréchal goes back at least to the 13th century. It represents the highest possible position of military authority, authority symbolised by a Marshal's baton. The title was abolished during the French Revolution as incompatible with the egalitarian spirit of the age. I have a question about the Marshal's baton. Uh, is that something that they carried around with them, um, or is that more of just like a decorative piece that they had sitting around at home? Uh, I don't know. Like, uh, I, I've heard a lot about it, but I'm not sure exactly how it was displayed or used on a regular basis. But in 1804, Napoleon founded a new empire and restored the ancient rank. This is Epic History TV's Guide to Napoleon's Marshals. All 26 have been ranked according to our own evaluation of their achievements as marshals, with expert guidance from retired Lieutenant Colonel Remy Porte, former Chief Historian of the French Army. I also remind you, you guys say Lieutenant over on uh, in Europe, right? Lieutenant, we say Lieutenant over here. Um, is, is it spelled the same way? Is this, if so, like, how do you get Lieutenant out of that? So far, we've met Marshals Perignon, Brun, Serrurier, Kellerman, Grouchy, Monse, Bonyatovsky, and Jordan. 18. Mm. Marshal Bernadotte. He's 18? Oh my gosh, I, I was expecting him to be, like, in the top 10, at least. Because I've heard so much about him, he was like... He was the most... Other than DeVoe, he was the most memorable marshal for me from the Napoleonic Wars. And uh, partially because I kept saying Bernadette since, instead of Bernadotte. Um, hmm. I guess maybe because of... Uh, you know, his betrayal of Napoleon and how he went and fought for Sweden in the end. Maybe that's why. But, uh, yeah, I'll, uh, this is going to be interesting because I know that Napoleon and Bernadotte did not like each other. Okay, so Napoleon says about him, I can only say that Bernadotte let me down. I can accuse him of ingratitude, but not of treason. Huh. Okay, I wasn't expecting that. Was it? I mean, didn't he basically commit treason? And from what I've heard, all of the, um, you know, family stuff going on between them behind the scenes. That seems like a really gracious quote by Napoleon, honestly. I was not expecting that. Bernadotte enlisted in the French Royal Army, aged 17, and proved a model soldier rising to become the senior non-commissioned officer in his regiment in just 10 years. The French Revolution and active service opened the door to rapid promotion. He was made an officer, and thanks to exemplary leadership and courage, rose in rank from captain to general of division in a single year. Not even Napoleon rose through the ranks as quickly. He particularly distinguished himself at Fleurus, leading an attack that helped secure Jourdan's famous victory. As a professional soldier and ex-Sergeant Major, Bernadotte insisted on the highest standards of discipline and conduct from his men. He even fought a duel with his own Chief of Staff, whom he accused of taking a bribe. In 1797, Bernadotte was transferred to Italy, where he served under Napoleon's command for the first time. By this stage, both men had brilliant reputations, but despite a good first meeting, a clash of styles and jealous rivalry soon emerged between them. What's more, Bernadotte had immediately got on the wrong side of the future Marshal Berthier, Napoleon's chief of staff, by arresting one of his friends for insubordination. In 1798, Bernadotte married Napoleon's ex-fiancée, Desiree Clary, her sister Julie was married to Napoleon's brother, Joseph, meaning Bernadotte was now family. But when Napoleon asked Bernadotte... That's awkward. ...to support his coup of 18 Brumaire, 
he refused, though he did not actively oppose it. Napoleon suspected Bernadotte of conspiring against him, but the Clary sisters helped to keep the peace. Throughout this period, Bernadotte held key posts as Minister of War in 1799, Commander of the Army of the West in 1800, and Governor of Hanover in 1804, proving highly effective in each role. That year, Napoleon made Bernadotte a Marshal, and he commanded First Corps at the Battle of Austerlitz, playing a relatively minor part in the Emperor's great victory. Nevertheless, he was rewarded with the title Prince of Pontecorvo. But his relationship with Napoleon remained difficult. In 1806, as Napoleon took on Prussia, Bernadotte was blamed for failing to support Marshal Davout at the Battle of Auerstedt, and was nearly court-martialed. Though Bernadotte partly redeemed himself with a vigorous pursuit of the beaten Prussians. The next year, he missed the Battle of Eylau, after his orders were intercepted by the Russians, and a gunshot wound to the neck meant he also missed the Battle of Friedland, with command of 1st Corps passing to General Victor. I missed the gunshot to the neck, I think, apparently, because that's news to me. Huh. They probably mentioned it. They probably mentioned it, and I just don't remember it. There's a lot of uh, generals and marshals that got shot and injured in the Napoleonic Wars. It's hard to keep track of all of them. But a uh, gunshot wound to the neck, like, man, that's definitely one place you do not... I mean, you don't want to get shot anywhere, but anywhere from, like, here up especially. Well, maybe... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Basically, chest up. Well, stomach... Never mind. You, just, you don't want to get shot. When war resumed with Austria in 1809, Bernadotte was given command of the 9th Saxon Corps. On the evening of the first day at the gigantic Battle of Wagram, his troops were in heavy fighting with the Austrians. But dressed in white, like the Austrians, they came under devastating friendly fire, panicked and routed. The next morning, Bernadotte pulled his men back without orders, and when they later retreated again, he and the Emperor exchanged sharp words on the battlefield. I remember that. Bernadotte then issued a proclamation to the Saxons, praising their conduct and outraging Napoleon. Bernadotte was sent in semi-disgrace to the Dutch coast to oversee the defeat of a major British landing at Valkelen. But another triumphant proclamation, effectively publicizing the strength of his forces, further infuriated Napoleon. In an unlikely twist of fate in 1810, Swedish politicians invited Bernadotte to become Crown Prince of Sweden. The current king was old and childless, and Bernadotte was a proven general and administrator, member of the French imperial family, and well regarded by Swedish army officers, who remembered his fair treatment of Swedish prisoners three years earlier in Pomerania. I mean, my question about this is, I know the, the Swedish king was childless, but did he not have any family? You know, I, I would think that it was stand a reason that he would want to keep the monarchy in the family. So was there not anybody at all, like extended family, ne nephews or cousins or whatever, to take the throne? Or is that just not how it worked? Um, so that just, that's interesting to me that they chose to go to a completely different country to get somebody instead of like keeping it in the family or in the country. But I guess that's just maybe the way it was done back then. Or maybe, you know, again, like, I feel like Americans were very uneducated about monarchies. We just, it's not, it's not a thing over here. We don't have the history with it. So we just don't understand how a lot of that works. But it seems like monarchies swap people from other countries a lot like king philip or not king philip but prince philip that um i kind of learned that he was um he was a greek he was from the greek monarchy and he went to england so obviously marrying um queen elizabeth but still it's like there's a lot of monarchy swapping going on in different countries and i don't understand 
how or why. Napoleon was at first bemused, remarking that he could think of other marshals who were better qualified, but he did give his assent, even when Bernadotte made it clear that as Crown Prince he would pursue Swedish interests. He was true to his word. Three years later, with Napoleon on the ropes after his disastrous invasion of Russia, Crown Prince Bernadotte brought Sweden into the Sixth Coalition and declared war on France. With his insider knowledge, he helped the Allies to devise the Trachenberg Plan, a strategy for defeating Napoleon in Germany by avoiding battle with Napoleon himself and targeting only his marshals. Oh, so he's the one that devised that plan. Okay, I was wondering kind of who came up with that. And I was also wondering when he switched sides, like did he use his knowledge that he had of Napoleon's tactics to help the Allies? And this answers my question. That's actually, huh. Okay, my respect for Bernadotte might have gone up a notch because I didn't know that that was like his mastermind, basically. At least that's what it's implying here. Maybe there's more to it than that. But interesting. Very interesting. In September, Bernadotte defeated former comrades Marshals Udino and Ney at Denevitz. Five weeks later, he played a major role in the great Allied victory at Leipzig. Bernadotte's legacy would prove the most lasting of any of Napoleon's marshals. The royal house of Bernadotte sits on the Swedish throne to this day. No way, his great-great-great-grandson, King Charles XVI Gustav, in Sweden. So one of my most loyal subscribers, Leo, he's from Sweden, and it, this just made me think of him. Um, so Gustav is your king in Sweden. Interesting. I feel like I've heard of him before, which I guess makes sense. Like he's a world leader, I suppose. King Carl, though. King Carl is... <laughs> I don't associate the, the name Carl with royalty for some reason, uh, but maybe that's just, you know... It's kind of just like a run-of-the-mill name over here in the U.S., but maybe it's a little different over there. Bernadotte was labelled a traitor by Napoleon's supporters, though not by Napoleon himself. He was unquestionably a gifted soldier and administrator. But his personality clash and long-running feud with the Emperor meant he was never a great marshal. So I don't know, like, I feel like if he was truly the person behind that strategy of avoiding war with Napoleon, going back to that, like, that was pretty epic, that, that Napoleonic Wars video, um, I guess it was Leipzig, um, a battle of the nations, uh, whatever it was called. Like, I really enjoyed that video, and one of the big reasons was because of that strategy of them avoiding Napoleon directly and fighting, going after his marshals. And it seems like that that was a strategy that was kind of a turning point. They kind of figured out how to defeat Napoleon at that point. That seems like a big deal, you know? So, I don't know what he's talking about. Uh, maybe, like, for Napoleon, he wasn't that good of a marshal. Maybe that's what, what he means by that. But uh, yeah, I was surprised to see him at 18 on this list. Regardless of whether he was a good marshal or not, I think he, he seemed to be, like, a pretty brilliant person, so... But I guess if you're going strictly by the marshal, like, a marshal for Napoleon, maybe 18 makes sense. 17. Marshal Ogero. His courage, his outstanding virtues elevated him far above the crowd, but honors, titles, and money plunged him back into it. What? Okay, this side would be interesting. Ogero had, by his own account, an eventful younger life. 
serving at various times with the French, Russian and Prussian armies, deserting or being kicked out of all three in dubious <laughs> circumstances. Okay. He briefly earned a living in Dresden as a fencing master, with a feared reputation as a duelist. He embraced the French Revolution and joined a volunteer cavalry regiment known as the German Legion, before holding various staff and training roles where his experience in the regular Prussian army proved valuable. Promoted to general, Augereau served in the Eastern Pyrenees, where his flair for tactics and bold, decisive action helped win a series of victories over the Spanish. Later serving in Italy under Napoleon, Augereau proved a highly effective divisional commander. I mean, if you just look at him, he looks like that eccentric type. I mean, the wild hair, that little facial expression, yeah. He looks like he has that personality. This guy's giving me a little kick here. I, I like him. He reminds me a bit of myself because I'm one of those people that ha has been like a jack of all trades. Like I've just moved around and done so many different things. I've never really settled on one specific thing to do in my life. So uh, I kind of like get where this guy is coming from as well. Although I've never been kicked out of an army before or multiple armies, so, but I, I want to know this guy's history, like his story, his backstory, because he sounds like an interesting uh, figure to study about. The future Emperor's reports were glowing. Strong character, firmness, energy, has the habit of war, liked by his men, and lucky. In 1796, Augereau played a leading role in Napoleon's victories over the Austrians at Castiglione, at Arcole. In fact, the painting of Augereau's heroism at Arcole Bridge long predates the more famous version by Vernet, in which Napoleon takes centre stage, and is an even greater work of fiction. Augereau's standing among fellow generals, however, was damaged by an enthusiasm for looting to rival General Brun, while others were irritated by his loud and boastful manner. Augereau was known to be a reliable Republican, and in 1797 Napoleon sent him to Paris to be the military muscle for the coup of 18 Fructidor. This was an army-backed purge of pro-royalist politicians threatening to restore the French monarchy. They keep talking about all of these coups. Um, the coup of Fructidor, the coup of... the coup of... Uh, shoot sort of the B or something, I forgot what the, what it was called, uh, they talked about a few minutes ago, in Italy, maybe? Um, so, these coups, like, I don't, I don't know what these coups are that they're talking about. Obviously, it's related to the French Revolution, I, was, I guess. Um, so, yeah, that's something I'm going to have to look more into, because I'm not sure, I'm not sure what they're talking about here. A brief spell in charge of the Army of the Rhine demonstrated that Augereau was not suited for high command, as his unruly entourage and obsession with plunder caused chaos at headquarters. As a Republican, Augereau initially opposed Napoleon's seizure of political power, but soon sensed which way the wind was blowing, and pledged support. Created a marshal in 1804, status, wealth and declining health served to mellow Augereau's behaviour. He commanded 7th Corps in the 1805 campaign, but was held in reserve and missed the great battles of Ulm and Austerlitz. The following year he was in the thick of the fighting at Jena, leading 7th Corps against the Prussian southern flank. At Eylau in 1807, Augereau was so ill he had to be strapped to his horse, but led 7th Corps into battle in terrible winter conditions. Ordered to advance, his corps lost its way in a blizzard, was mown down by Russian guns, charged and virtually destroyed. Augereau himself was hit and crushed under his own horse. He returned to France to recover, but was never the same again. His oh. energy and seal were gone. I thought he was dead after being crushed under his horse. Man. 
During Napoleon's war in Spain, he was sent to replace Saint-Cyr as commander of the Army of Catalonia. He completed the grim seven-month siege of Girona, but was soon replaced by Macdonald for his lacklustre performance. In 1812, Augereau commanded depots and reinforcements in the rear, as the Grande d'Armée marched to its destruction in Russia. However, at Leipzig he was briefly back to his best, inspiring his small corps of conscripts to fight for several key villages in the south, in the face of relentless Austrian attack. In 1814, Napoleon gave Augereau command of the Army of the Rhone. But he surrendered Lyon without a fight, and on news of Napoleon's abdication, denounced his former emperor as a man who, having sacrificed millions of victims to his cruel ambitions, has not known how to die like a soldier. <laughs> when Napoleon returned from exile in 1815, Augereau proclaimed his loyalty once more. But the Emperor was not interested. Augereau was stripped of his baton, and died the next year. 16. Marshal Lefebvre Truly brave man who does not concern himself with the maneuvers on his left and right, but thinks only of fighting well and is not afraid to die. Hmm. <clears throat> Seems straightforward. Francois Lefebvre was a sergeant with 16 years' service in the elite Garde Française when the French Revolution broke out. When the Guard was disbanded, he became an officer in the Paris National Guard, and received the first of many wounds protecting the royal family from an angry mob. Every inch the soldier, the Revolutionary Wars brought Lefebvre opportunity for active command and rapid promotion. In just two years, he rose from captain to general, establishing a reputation as a formidable divisional commander, a good tactician, brave, energetic, and attentive to the needs of his men. His chief of staff, the future Marshal Soult, acknowledged that he learned much from Lefebvre's example. In 1799, Lefebvre commanded the Paris military district. Not much impressed by politicians, when Napoleon asked him to support a coup, he was all for it. Oh, that's the one. Declaring, yes, let's throw the lawyers into the river. The coup of 18 Brut. What's the 18 mean? Brumaire is, that's the one I was trying to remember before. I mean, what I'm getting from this is they're just taking uh, bits and pieces of the French government, whether it's lawyers or, uh, you know, I don't know whatever, um, and getting rid of them. It seems like piece by piece or something. Is that, that's what I'm getting from this, but maybe that's not, maybe that's not right. The directory, he overthrows the directory. Don't know what that is. In 1804, Napoleon made Lefebvre an honorary marshal. Honorary, because Napoleon assumed Lefebvre would prefer a quiet life in the Senate, after a decade's active service with the scars to prove it. But he'd underestimated Lefebvre, who pleaded for a frontline role. So the Emperor gave him command of the Imperial Guard Infantry for the Jena campaign. The next year, Lefebvre commanded the Siege of Danzig, inspiring the troops of 10th Corps by leading one counterattack in person. After the successful conclusion of the siege, Napoleon awarded Lefebvre the title Duke of Danzig. Lefebvre's record as a corps commander was mixed. In Spain, he exasperated Napoleon by twice ignoring orders. But in 1809, when Archduke Charles of Austria launched a sudden attack on Bavaria, Lefebvre's Bavarian 7th Corps was crucial in slowing the enemy advance, until Napoleon arrived to take charge. He was then given the difficult task of suppressing a popular revolt in the Tyrol, led by Andreas Hofer, which he achieved despite some early setbacks. 
For the invasion of Russia, Lefebvre commanded the infantry of the Old Guard. During the retreat from Moscow, the 57-year-old Marshal insisted on marching on foot at the head of the Guard all the way. At the end of the retreat, he was devastated to learn that his son, a 27-year-old general, was among nearly a hundred thousand men who had not survived the march. He had been Lefebvre's last surviving child, of 14. After oh, 14 a year kids. recovering from exhaustion and grief, Lefebvre returned to lead the Old Guard one last time in the defence of France, and was in heavy fighting at Montmiral and Montereau. But in April 1814, he was one of the marshals who confronted Napoleon with the reality of his position, and forced him to abdicate. Lefebvre and his wife, an ex-washerwoman turned duchess, were famous for their lack of airs and graces, for honest, blunt speech, and for always helping out old comrades. When a friend commented on Lefebvre's wealth and titles, the marshal invited him into the courtyard, I'll have ten shots at you with a musket at thirty paces, he told him. If I miss, the whole estate is yours. When the friend declined, Lefebvre added, I had a thousand bullets fired at me from closer before I got all this. Lefebvre was too exhausted to take an active role in the Waterloo campaign, though he accepted a role as a senator under Napoleon, which led to a brief period in disgrace when the Bourbons returned. His rank and honours were restored to him a year before his death, in 1820. 15. Marshal Mortier Three best of my generals were Devove, Salt, and Bessier. Bessier. Mortier was the most feeble. <laughs> oh, okay. So, uh, based on Napoleon's uh, perspective here, I'm assuming Devaux, Salt, and Bessier, Bessier um, are going to be in the top five, maybe. That's just that's going on Napoleon's opinion. Uh, Epic History TV's opinion, I don't know. Edouard Mortier was from a prosperous middle class background in northern France. When the French Revolution began in 1789, he volunteered for the National Guard, a new middle-class militia charged with preserving order and defending against counter-revolution. When war broke out with France's neighbours, Mortier's unit was sent to the front. Standing six foot four, Mortier was conspicuous for his height and bravery, being wounded twice and winning praise from his commander, the future Marshal Lefebvre. In 1799, Mortier fought under General Massena's command at the Second Battle of Zurich, helping to defeat the Russians and winning promotion to the rank of General of Division. Mortier then spent three years commanding the Paris military district. His efficiency impressed the new First Consul, Napoleon Bonaparte, who chose him for an important mission in 1803. The occupation of Hanover, a German state belonging to the Hanoverian kings of Britain, with whom France was, once more, at war. Mortier carried out this assignment with tact and diplomacy, ensuring the occupation was unopposed. This delighted Napoleon, who rewarded him a year later with the rank of Marshal. Following Napoleon's victory over the Austrians at Ulm in 1805, Mortier and his new Eighth Corps led the pursuit of the retreating Russians, but became encircled by a much larger force at Durenstein. Mortier fought his way out of the trap with a nighttime bayonet charge, a remarkable escape, but his corps suffered heavy losses. Mortier and 8th Corps were in a supporting role for the Jena campaign of 1806. But the next year at Friedland, his corps played an important role holding Napoleon's left wing, as the Emperor inflicted a devastating defeat on the Russians. Mortier was well liked by all, and almost uniquely did not engage in feuds and rivalries with the other marshals. Boudinot was a particular friend. 
In East Prussia, their party trick was to snuff out the candles with pistol shots. They always paid generous compensation for damage caused. In 1808, Mortier joined Napoleon for the invasion of Spain, and commanded V Corps at the brutal Siege of Zaragoza. He then helped win a series of victories over Spanish forces, including the crushing victory at Ocaña, operating alongside another friend, Marshal Soult. Mortier was recalled to France to organise and train the Young Guard, a new junior unit of the Imperial Guard, made up of the best conscripts from each year's intake. Mortier led the Young Guard in Russia in 1812, but was powerless to prevent the Corps' destruction on that campaign. First through exhaustion and disease on the march to Moscow, then on the retreat, where his surviving troops were effectively sacrificed to hold open the road at Krasny and allow the army's escape. Mortier continued to command the Young Guard during Napoleon's campaigns in Germany and France, and was never far from the action. At Lützen, he was trapped under his wounded horse, was in heavy fighting at Leipzig, and had his hat shot through outside Paris. In 1814, the final defence of the French capital fell to troops under Mortier and Marmont, with support from Marshal Monsey's National Guard. Mortier told his men, we have not enough troops to resist their large armies for long, but today, more than ever before, we are fighting for our honour. When Napoleon returned from exile in 1815, he wanted Mortier to resume his customary role at the head of the Young Guard, but a severe attack of sciatica prevented him joining the Emperor at Waterloo. Napoleon never regarded Mortier as suitable for major independent command, but his loyalty and conduct were always beyond reproach. He went on to serve the restored monarchy as ambassador to Russia and briefly minister for war. In 1835, he was riding beside King Louis Philippe in a public parade when an assassin opened fire with a homemade multi barreled gun. The king received a minor wound but Marshal Mortier and 17 others were killed. 17? Wait, what? Philippe in a public parade, when an assassin opened fire with a homemade multi-barreled gun. The king received a minor wound, but Marshal Mortier and 17 others were killed. A multi-barreled gun, I guess that means, does that mean that the bullets spread out or something and they hit more than one person? Because at first, uh, when I first heard that, uh, I thought it was just like one shot and then Mortier died, but then he said like 17 and so, uh, sorry, that took me off guard for a second. I guess multi-barreled gun um, would hit more than one person then. It also surprises me that uh, King Louis would employ Napoleon's marshals in important roles like that. Since they're like, didn't they fight, weren't they fighting like against the monarchy, like on the side against the monarchy? Marmont. 14. Marshal Marmont. I remember him. I was betrayed by Marmont whom I could call my son, my child, my creation. Vanity was his undoing. Wasn't Marmont the one that uh, basically refused to fight with Napoleon for the defense of Paris? He was basically like the one that was like, hey, it's over, um, let's, let's just call it quits or whatever. I feel like he's the one that did that, but I might not be remembering that correctly. Marmont, like Napoleon, was a trained artillery officer, and met the future emperor for the first time at the Siege of Toulon, where Napoleon made his name. They formed a friendship, and when Napoleon was given command of the French army in Italy, he took Major Marmont with him as an aide-de-camp. Marmont distinguished himself at several of Napoleon's early victories in Italy and was commanding his own artillery regiment by the age of 23. 
As part of Napoleon's inner circle, Marmont accompanied him on his expedition to Egypt. Oh. Okay, this is something I've never seen before. Like modern, or well, semi-modern warfare happening with the pyramids in the background. That's kind of cool, actually. Um, I don't know, there's just something about this, this picture that gets me. It's just, it's like anachronistic. It feels, it feels anachronistic because uh, the pyramids I associate with like ancient times and then we have this going on in front of it. It's just that, hmm. Egypt in 1798, fighting in the battles of Alexandria and the pyramids. Naturally, he backed Napoleon's coup of 18 Brumaire as Napoleon overthrew the directory and made himself first consul of again. France. <laughs> Six months later, Napoleon led an army over the Alps into Italy. It was his artillery commander, General Marmont, who figured out how to get the cannon through the mountain passes using man-hauled sledges. At the ensuing Battle of Marengo, Marmont's skilled handling of the artillery helped Napoleon to win a decisive victory over the Second Coalition. Two years later, Marmont was made Inspector General of Artillery working with Napoleon to implement reforms that improved firepower, mobility and supply. Marmont was bitterly disappointed not to be among the first marshals created in 1804. But he was still only 29, and Napoleon assured him that time was on his side. He was further frustrated in 1805, when his corps was sent to guard the army's strategic southern flank, and so missed the great victory at Austerlitz. The spoils of that war included Dalmatia, which Marmont was sent to govern in 1806. Though he lived in extravagant luxury, his reforms and infrastructure projects were so effective that even the Emperor of Austria later admitted, it's a great pity that Marmont was not in Dalmatia two or three years it's longer. A really random weird question, do the Dalmatian dogs have anything to do with Dalmatia? I just, that's just what popped into my head when I saw that. When war broke out with Austria again in 1809, Marmont marched north with 11th Corps to join Napoleon near Vienna. But at the Great Battle of Wagram, his troops remained in reserve, while the other corps were engaged in ferocious fighting. At last, an opportunity to prove himself came as Napoleon ordered him to pursue the retreating Austrians. But reckless over-enthusiasm nearly led to disaster at Znaim. A week later, Napoleon created three new marshals, Macdonald, Oudinot and Marmont. Macdonald for France, it was said, Oudinot for the army, Marmont for friendship. Napoleon then rather undermined the moment by telling Marmont, between ourselves, you've not yet done enough to justify my choice. His big chance came in 1811, when he was sent to Spain to replace Marshal Massena. But after a promising start, and some bold manoeuvring against the British on the Douro River, he stumbled into disaster at Salamanca. Marmont himself was an early casualty of the battle, badly wounded by a shell burst and carried from the field, as Wellington routed his army. After convalescing in France, Marmont was back with the Grande Armée in 1813, as Napoleon battled to save his empire. He commanded 6th Corps throughout the campaign in Germany, fighting at Lützen, Bautzen and Dresden. At Leipzig, he held the northern sector with skill and determination, making Blücher's Prussians pay a high price for the village of Mürker. Marmont played an important role in Napoleon's 1814 defence of France, shadowing Blücher's movements along the Marne River and guarding the road to Paris. But by now he was showing signs of exhaustion and disillusion. At the Battle of Long, he allowed his corps to be surprised by the enemy, with heavy loss. Napoleon's stinging criticism may have been the moment that ended Marmont's loyalty. He was the senior marshal in Paris when the Allies attacked on the 30th of March. After a day's fighting and facing inevitable defeat, he negotiated the city's surrender. 
five days later, with Napoleon at Fontainebleau still planning to march on Paris, Marmont marched his corps over to the Allied lines and surrendered. Yeah, this is, this is where... Napoleon was shocked at this betrayal by one of his oldest comrades. He'd already been persuaded that he must try to abdicate in favour of his three-year-old son. Now he accepted that he must abdicate without conditions. Whether Marmont acted to save lives, out of self-interest or spite, or a combination of all three, remains the subject of heated debate. We do know that he was well rewarded by the restored Bourbon king, and never forgiven by Bonaparte loyalists. As military commander of Paris in 1830, Marmont could not prevent the next revolution, and had to flee France. There's another he spent revolution the rest of his in France? So the French Revolution was not the French Revolution, it was one of the French Revolutions, was that whether it's... So the monarchy came back and then they had another revolution, they got rid of the monarchy again, is that what happened? Um... Oh my gosh, I'm going to get up on my French history because... Obviously I have no clue what happened. Flee France. He spent the rest of his life in exile becoming tutor while he was in Vienna to Napoleon's son, the Duke of Reichstadt. He was the last of Napoleon's marshals to die, in Venice, in 1852. Bernadotte, Augereau, Lefebvre, Mortier, Marmont. 13 down, 13 to go. Okay, so of these next eight, Bernadotte has my number one spot just for the fact that he outmaneuvered Napoleon um, at Leipzig and kind of came up with the Allied strategy. At least I'm assuming that was him that kind of led all of that, but maybe, like I said, there's more to it than that. He impressed me the most out of all of these so far. I would definitely have to put him above Kellerman. So Kellerman, you are knocked out of the spot. Bernadotte, you have taken my number one spot so far in this series. All right, well, that is going to do it for Napoleon's Marshals Part 2. That was a, a lot of fun. Again, I'm enjoying learning more about, like, just his, the French history in general and French society going along with the Marshals because we're getting a lot of backstory and additional information that I did not get in the Napoleonic War series. So looking forward to part three. I think there are there are five parts. There are five parts to this. And you know what I just realized? <laughs> Roger, why are you not wearing your hat? <laughs> Sorry, I forgot. We'll just... It's my fault. It's my fault. Anyway... <laughs> Roger here, and I appreciate you guys watching. Uh, check me out on social media. I've got all of the links to those things down below in my pinned comment and in the description if you're interested in following me there. Lots of fun new stuff coming up on this channel this summer, so make sure you stay tuned for all of that. Stay tuned for part three of Napoleon's Marshals. So with that said, Roger and I will see you next time.